Assalamu alaikum dear students welcome to Dr. Romi lectures in our previous session we studied those anticoagulants which are present naturally inside our body in today's session we are going to study the anticoagulants which can be used clinically some of these anticoagulants they are produced inside the body and some of them are synthesized in the lab anticoagulants are those substances which can prevent or postpone blood coagulation anticoagulants can be used in vivo which means they can prevent coagulation within our body they can be used in vitro which means they can prevent coagulation in the lab or they can be used both in vivo and in vitro the first anticoagulant which we will discuss today is heparin heparin is a natural anticoagulant which is produced by the mast cells and basophils heparin alone has almost no anticoagulant activity however heparin acts as a cofactor for antithrombin 3 antithrombin 3 is a protein in our plasma heparin is a cofactor for this antithrombin 3 protein so when heparin binds with antithrombin 3 then this complex of heparin and antithrombin 3 it becomes activated and this removes thrombin the removal of thrombin is the function of antithrombin 3 which is enhanced up to 100 to thousands of fold by the action of heparin which acts as a cofactor for antithrombin 3 not only heparin activates antithrombin 3 to remove the clotting factor number 2 which is thrombin but it also inactivates some already activated clotting factors which are clotting factor number 9, 10, 11 and 12. So you can see here all these clotting factors they are present in the intrinsic pathway. So it means the main action of heparin is on intrinsic pathway. Normally concentration of heparin is very low in our plasma but pharmacologically whenever heparin is used it is used in relatively higher concentrations. So when we have to prevent coagulation in our body the dose of heparin which can be given usually it is 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram of the body weight. Heparin increases clotting time from normal 6 minutes up to 30 minutes. Heparin is a negatively charged heteropolysaccharide molecule which is mainly produced by the mast cells and also by the basophils in the blood in lungs and liver. Why in lungs and liver? Because lungs and liver they remove most of the emboli which are formed in the slowly flowing blood. For example, when blood is slowly flowing in our leg veins, some clots may form which may break away from there and those clots when they are received in our lungs, lungs have to remove those clots. The action of heparin will prevent the further growth of those clots in lungs and liver. Heparin is an injectable anticoagulant which can be given intravenously or subcutaneously. It is prepared from the liver of animals. The action of heparin is instantaneous. So in emergency cases when we need instantaneous anticoagulation, heparin is the choice. And the action of heparin is terminated by the action of enzyme called as heparinase which is present in our blood plasma. Heparin is one of the most uh, expensive uh, anticoagulants and some of the important clinical uses of heparin are it can be used when we pass blood through heart lung machine for example in case of cardiac transplant. It can also be used when we pass blood through artificial kidney machine during dialysis. Heparin is also used as an anticoagulant when we collect blood for some investigations like for osmotic fragility test and also for some of the enzymatic testing of the red blood cells. For example, for testing the glucose 6PD deficiency, each type of vacutainer which contains some kind of anticoagulant like heparin, EDTA has uh, different types of color of the top. So those vacutainer which contain heparin in it, they have a color of the top which is green. What is the antidote which can be given to antagonize the action of heparin if a patient has been given excessive doses of heparin? The answer is protamine sulfate. So protamine sulfate is a chemical antidote which can bind with heparin to antagonize the action of heparin in case of excessive doses of heparin. Second important anticoagulant is warfarin. Warfarin is coumarin derivative. This is oral anticoagulant as compared to heparin which is injectable anticoagulant. Usually heparin is given in emergency cases when instantaneous uh, anticoagulation is required but warfarin is given in those cases where maintenance of anticoagulation is required as you know very well that 
there are some clotting factors in our liver which are activated by the action of vitamin K. This vitamin K converts clotting factor number 2, 7, 9 and 10 from their immature forms into mature forms and these immature clotting factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 become mature when gamma glutamyl carboxylase enzyme adds another carboxyl group at the gamma position of glutamic acid residues within these proteins. So when these uh, immature clotting factors become mature, they contain more carboxyl groups which are negatively charged and hence they can bind with more calcium. And because calcium is important for coagulation to occur in this way, these clotting factors they can perform their action. However, during this process of uh, making these mature clotting factors, this reduced vitamin K which is the active form, this becomes inactive because during this process this is oxidized. So we have to convert this uh, oxidized vitamin K back into the reduced form and for this we need another enzyme which is called as apoxide reductase enzyme which is also called as vitamin K dependent apoxide reductase enzyme 1. So this warfarin anticoagulant this inhibits the action of apoxide reductase enzyme in this way the oxidized form of vitamin K is not converted back into the reduced active form of vitamin K and hence this vitamin K cannot perform its action and the immature clotting factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 they are not activated. And similar effect can also occur in case of liver failure because these clotting factors they are synthesized by liver. So in case of liver failure these clotting factors will not be synthesized and this person will be having bleeding tendency. So when warfarin antagonize the action of vitamin K by blocking this enzyme epoxide reductase then these clotting factors although they are synthesized but they are biologically inactive which means they do not become mature. After 12 hours of administration of warfarin the clotting activity of the blood can be reduced to 50% of the normal and after 24 hours that is after one day of administration of warfarin the clotting activity of the blood can be reduced to just 20% of the normal. So as compared to action of heparin which is instantaneous it takes some time to start its action. It's slow to act. After stopping warfarin, the clotting activity of blood returns back to normal within one to three days. Warfarin is an oral anticoagulant and this can be used to prevent thrombosis, which can be caused for myocardial infarction, for stroke and for deep vein thrombosis of the legs. So we already know that the antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate. What are the antidotes for warfarin? These are vitamin K, which acts very slowly. So it will antagonize the action of warfarin within 12 to 24 hours and fresh frozen plasma which can take a few hours to antagonize the action of warfarin and PCC which is prothrombin complex concentrate which can take just several minutes to antagonize the action of warfarin. Now let's quickly compare the features of heparin with warfarin. Heparin acts mainly on intrinsic pathway and warfarin acts mainly on extrinsic pathway. Heparin's mechanism of action is that it binds with antithrombin 3 as a cofactor and then it removes thrombin from the blood plasma and also inactivates the already activated clotting factors 9, 10, 11 and 12. And warfarin inhibits the apoxoid reductase enzyme which is required for vitamin K's action to convert the immature clotting factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 to mature forms. Heparin is injectable anticoagulant which is given intravenously or subcutaneously and warfarin is oral anticoagulant which is taken as a tablet. The onset of action of heparin is instantaneous so that's why this can be given in emergency condition but warfarin's action starts slowly. The duration of action of heparin is uh, for four to six hours but that for warfarin it is for several days. Heparin is eliminated through kidneys and warfarin it is eliminated through liver. The action of heparin can be monitored through APTT which is activated partial thromboplastin time and this tests the action of intrinsic pathway and the action of warfarin can be monitored through PT test which is prothrombin time and that tests the activity of extrinsic pathway. The antidote for heparin is protamin sulfate and that for warfarin is vitamin K and fresh frozen plasma. Heparin is not teratogenic which means it cannot cause anomalies in the fetus. It cannot cross placenta. Hence, it is safe to be given during pregnancy. But warfarin is teratogenic because it can cross placenta, so it cannot be given during pregnancy. Heparin is usually given 
to initiate anticoagulant therapy and warfarin it can be given to maintain anticoagulant therapy another important anticoagulant is edta which stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid this is a strong anticoagulant which can chelate calcium from blood which means it can complex with the calcium and by removing calcium from the blood it decreases the ionized calcium in the blood and hence prevent coagulation you know that calcium is a very important electrolyte which is required for almost all the reactions of extrinsic pathway intrinsic pathway and the common pathway except the first two reactions of the intrinsic pathway those vacutainers which contain edta as an anticoagulant the color of their top is purple and these vacutainers they are usually used to collect blood for routine hematological investigations for example for hemoglobin estimation for hematocrit estimation for cbc complete blood count and also for making blood films which are required for differential leukocyte count and also for testing hemoglobin a1c in diabetic patients oxalates are another type of anticoagulant these uh, oxalates they can also bind with calcium hence they make calcium oxalates which are insoluble they will precipitate and blood coagulation will not occur so just like edta oxalates also chelate calcium and prevent blood coagulation a disadvantage of oxalate anticoagulants is that they cannot be used in vivo because they are poisonous so they are only used in labs for estimation of some blood parameters for example esr estimation and for hematocrit estimation a common oxalate which is used for anticoagulation is called as double oxalate and this contains uh, ammonium oxalate and potassium oxalate these two are present in a ratio of 3 to 2 which means three parts of ammonium oxalate and two parts of potassium oxalates are present in double oxalate when ammonium oxalate alone is used it will cause swelling of the red blood cells and when potassium oxalates alone is used it will cause crenation of red blood cells but together they will nullify the effect of each other on the volume of red blood cells another anticoagulant is citrate citrate is used in the form of sodium citrate or potassium citrate or ammonium citrate so when they react with the blood they make calcium citrate in this way calcium will be deionized it will make a complex it will precipitate and also it will not be available in the form of ionized calcium it is ionized calcium which is required for blood clotting but when calcium will make complex with citrate this will become deionized and hence the blood coagulation will be prevented the advantage of citrate is that it can be used as anticoagulant both in vitro as well as in vivo so when the citrate will be injected in human beings through vein this citrate will be removed by liver and liver will convert into glucose or it will be metabolized the blood bag which contains usually about 500 ml of blood it contains citrate and blood in a ratio of 1 to 4 so when citrated blood is transfused to a person at a normal speed this citrate will not do any harm to the person but when citrated plasma is given to a person at a very rapid speed or if the liver of person is not functioning normally there is liver failure then what may happen these large amounts of citrate can bind with calcium then deficiency of calcium will occur in plasma and this can cause tetany and sometimes convulsive death of the patient citrate can also be used as an anticoagulant for blood coagulation studies like for pt and aptt tests a form of citrate also called as formal citrate which is present in desi solution this can be used for counting red blood cells or platelet counts when we are using a microscope and newborn chamber for counting these cells siliconized container can also prevent coagulation for about 1 hour or more when we place blood in a container which is just simple glass container then blood comes in contact with the inner surface of this glass tube the inner surface of the glass tube is rough and this causes contact activation of platelets and clotting factor number 12 and hence the coagulation will occur very quickly within 6 minutes but if the inner surface of this glass tube it is siliconized then it becomes smooth and it prevent the contact activation of the platelets and clotting factor number 12 and in this way the clotting of blood can be prevented for 1 hour or even more so in today's session we have studied some anticoagulants which can be used clinically some are used only in vivo some are used only in vitro and some are used both in our next session we will study some conditions in which excessive bleeding may occur thank you so much for watching this video see you next time with another video